And we're live. Welcome back to another Corona Geek here where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. I'm your host, Charles McKeever, and today we're going to talk about coroutines in Lua, the pros and cons of those. And we're also going to talk about 2D shadows, how to, to trick out your games with uh, some 2D effects. So joining us for coroutines is Stephen Johnson, a.k.a. Star Crunch in the forums. Hey, Stephen. Oh, hi. And also Renee, a, uh, Renee I from pyropixel.de. Did I say that right, Renee? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's, it's close enough. Okay. Uh, before we get into today's topic, what's that? I said he slaughters everybody's name, don't I you? do. I, I, I do. I'm an equal opportunity name mangler. Oh, you did great on mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Johnson and Smith, I can do. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into today's topic, uh, let's introduce our guests on the show here. We've got Dr. Brian Burton down in Abilene. Hey, Dr. B Dr. Burton. Well, I always like I always like to get it all in there. Dr. Brian Burton, like really, you know. And if you look up Brian Burton, you have to put in the doctor piece because there's other Brian Burtons out there apparently. Just a few, yes. Just, just a few. Also joining us is Ed Marina from RoamingGamer.com. Hey, Ed. And also joining us is Greg Pugh from GP Animations out there in uh, somewhere in the Pennsylvania area. He, at least, yeah. he, leads, he leads me to believe that. His, his Facebook changes all the time. Sometimes he's out of country. Sometimes he's in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I don't think he ever leaves the house. So. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> well, if you didn't get a chance to watch uh, last week's show, number 121, we talked about uh, – we actually talked with Chris Nader, CEO of Menu Me, about reinventing restaurant menus. They have a beautiful app that you can find at menu.me. Uh, Ed is doing the, some of the development. Some or all? Ed, so Ed, are you doing some of the development work? or All the coding. All the coding. There yeah. you go. All the coding for that app. It's a beautiful app. Uh, and we talked a, a, a lot about how uh, Minumi was accomplishing things like uh, you know some of the lazy loading for their images because it's all high quality, high res images. Uh, and in I guess in, in food parlance you would call it food porn. It, it's really uh, geared to to attract to attract your eye and and and. and give you more details about a menu items when you go to into a restaurant or before you go into a restaurant. So go check that out. It was a great discussion, uh, and you can find that at youtube.com slash coronageek is the best place to find all the videos uh, that we have. Also, if you haven't been to Corona University in a while, go to coronalabs.com slash university, and there is a new video up there for creating a virtual environment uh, using VMware for creating Windows Phone 8 apps. So if you are running a Mac or you don't have the latest version of Windows and you want to just set up a, a virtual environment where you can do all of that, uh, then you can uh, you don't want to watch that video. It, it talks about how to get things set up and how to get uh, get your whole environment set up. Everything from the you know the VMware to Windows uh, and also uh, Corona cards and all that kind of stuff. So go check it out. I don't did you guys see last week uh, I, we didn't talk about it I, I just totally skipped over it uh, but uh, Jason Schroeder put out a uh, progress ring module for corona did you guys see that it, it's pretty slick it, with one line of code you can put it into your uh, apps and you can define uh, a progress ring whether you want it to be the, the size the shape the color the you know the, the different aspects of it it's really nice um, I'm already and, yeah, I'll put the link in the show notes, but uh, yeah, definitely go and grab it, download it, uh, put it in your toolbox. It's uh, it's a nice nice addition. And uh, if you don't know, Jason is the developer of Social Poetry, which is kind of one of those uh, uh, apps where you can take and put like, remember magnets where you word magnets on your refrigerator where you would create little poems and stuff out of just the different words and stuff. Well, he's he's created an app that does that. So we'll put a link in the show notes to the progress ring. Go check that out and go check out his app, Social Pro Poetry. Also, uh, coming up on the end of the year here, it's just a few more days left, and if you haven't already. Now is the time to go over to BurtonsMediaGroup.com and get your training materials. Buy a book over there on Corona SDK. Teach yourself how to do everything from the beginning of creating variables all the way out to different aspects of the Corona API. So uh, if you're going to go over there, which you should, 
use Corona Geek as the coupon code at checkout, and you'll save 20% on your purchase. So you might want to buy two books while you're there. We, we got beginner, we got intermediate, we've got all kinds of skill levels set up for training, um, and I've added a few chapters over this last year on the new liquid tools that are from Google that have been included in the Corona SDK as well as some more advanced uh, topics at the end of the book. So if you haven't updated, you should update your book as well. Oh, excellent. Well, there you go. And and, and uh, just like uh, Brian's saying, you know, if you buy the book today and he pushes an update, you're going to get that update. And you can't really say that about a physical book, and you can't say it about any of the digital books that I've seen. Uh, most of them are just, they're printed and they're done. Uh, but you know, Brian keeps it updated. Which yeah, I, I'm is, ahead of my time here. It's, you are ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, you'll be putting movies up on Google Play. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you and, tape your lectures? What, yeah, do you tape your lectures? Uh, I have taped some of them. I, I'm in the process of digitizing more of them. Oh, that would be so cool. I, I've got a whole bunch on Java that I did a few years ago. Oh, yeah. I taped a, a whole semester. And I, I'm in the slow process of going through and getting them ready to be posted. Very cool. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's a, a great way to learn, and even if you can't attend the class. And I know you, you know, universities are uh, interested in getting people in the seats and, and paying uh, for curriculums and stuff like that, but it's a great way to audit a, a course to see if you want to be a part of it. Yeah. And if you haven't, uh, you know, it's the end of the year, almost a couple of days left, but there's still time to go out and ship that one last project. So if you haven't been over to shipjam.com, then this would be a good opportunity to go check it out. They are um, hosting a, a, a jam where you can ship that last uh, or that project before the end of the year, um, and there are prizes available over there, so go check it out. And uh, there's still time. You can put it up in the, the Google Play Store if you want. Uh, and I, I don't think that is, Apple's kind of closed right now, right? When's their window? Their window is, is kind of closed off, but if you... You want to get it, you know, shipped and get it out the door. You can, you know, put They're it on Google today. Play. Are they open today? Oh yeah, they they reopened today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they so the idea is to have it shipped. So uh, you pull that dust off that code from the hard drive and and do whatever you need to do to get it out the door. Don't worry about it being perfect. Just just ship it. <laughs> Shipjam.com. All right. Uh, let's see here. And let's go ahead and announce our winner. Uh, I'm going to say winner of two prizes. Greg Pugh from GP Animations is uh, is today's winner. He played uh, City Birds, which you can find at citybirdsgame.com. And yeah, I don't know what was your high score over there, Greg. Do you remember like forty two thousand or something? Uh, I don't remember. I played it for a while. I maxed out the multipliers you can get. I kind of got addicted to it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he played uh, he played this the dog out of it and and uh, and won that competition and then. Uh, we had a second prize going out for playing um, the Android slash iOS game Vitra, and I, I didn't see anybody submit uh, an entry for that. So he went over ahead and played it uh, just before the show, and by virtue of being the only one to play, he has won that one as well. So, uh, so Greg's going to get two fifty dollar gift cards for uh, to the retailer of his choice. I, I don't know exactly what that is at the moment, um, but. If you are interested in that sort of thing, we're going to be announcing the next game for January here pretty soon, uh, within the next couple of days, and you can play along and win a $50 gift card next month. We'll, we'll get all the details out there on, by next show. Uh, okay, let's get into... Uh, well, first of all, before I do that, real quickly, does anybody on the panel have anything that they wanted to, to announce? Nope. Going once, going twice? Okay. Oh, I said... I guess I mentioned before the show, uh, check out militantgame.com. It's not out yet, but it's a game that we've got in the works. Uh, okay. Militant, like military, like militant, that kind of? Right. Militant okay. game. Militantgame.com. Okay. So I guess there's a uh, landing page. Uh, yeah. can, you get on the, can you get on the newsletter or like them or do something like that there? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, all right. should be Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. All that. All the, all the good stuff. Yeah, I love going to a site where um, they don't have any of that. I'm like, well, how am I? What is that? 
<laughs> you spent all the time. You spent all the time to get me there, and then it was a little more active than the site itself. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's the point is to connect with somebody in some way, and then and then you can follow up with them later. You know. But if you spend all that time and energy to get somebody to your website, you know, at least give them a Twitter or a handle or a Facebook something. I don't know. Right. That's okay. That's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> Keep that in mind. All right. Bro. Was that, yeah, let, me, let, me tell, let me tell you what's on my mind. Let's, uh, what's on my mind is coroutines. I tell you what, Stephen, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what coroutines were. It sounds fairly obvious, um, you know, it, but I didn't know what they were. And so I went out and I looked at some uh, YouTube videos and I uh, found some, a fairly good explanation on um, the Lua site. And so what, what is a coroutine? What, what, is, what is it? Why should we use it? Okay, well, I'm at home right now, and I was talking to my mom about this, and she was asking, What's, what are you going to be talking about on this show? And I said that. I said coroutines, and she, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know what the situation is like, right? Yeah, well, oh, sure. Oh, yeah, I have friends and family, too, that have no idea what I do. So, so I thought about it for a while, and there there was a previous conversation where she asked the same thing about algorithms. And we finally came down to, it's a recipe. Right? Yeah. It explains step by step how to go through code. And so I, th I finally recalled that and, and said, well, imagine if you were making a big meal, like your Christmas dinner. You wouldn't make everything in a row. Because one item would get hot, then You'd, you'd start making the next time you cook it. The other item would start getting cold. You want to make them all at the same time, but not literally at the same time where you're, you know, got two hands going, one working on this food item, one working on this food item. What you would do is you would do a little task, one one dish, then you would set it aside for a little while, go on to another one, go on to another one. At the at the end, you have a complete meal. But you didn't do anything all the way through. You broke it up into several tasks that were more or less concurrent. And a coroutine lets you break up code in that way. So you can go straight down the code for a little while, but then you take a break, you work on some other code, work on that, come back to the other. And so it changes the way you structure your programs, but it allows certain patterns that would be hard to do, or in some cases, maybe outright impossible. It, it kind of sounds like thread, threading. Is it, this it, the same thing? It is, it is a bit like threads, except threads, preemptive threads, which is what people usually mean, will interrupt the code. And that is uh, difficult <laughs> because you need to coordinate where the interrupt, not where the interruptions will occur, but where they cannot occur. Mm. Because if if you don't guard against that, they can potentially run over data that you are going to use or that you're trying to use at the same time, and you get something that's half complete, and they are not fun to debug. <laughs> and and, and thread. And threading is, I mean, to correct me if I'm wrong, I've always like, kind of avoided focusing on it because it always seems like it's uh, this magic thing that is automatic, automatically managed by the system or, as you say, is you know, really hard to, to, to control. It, it can be hard to get right, yes. So, yeah, to get, hard to get right, yeah. Okay, maybe that's, maybe that's my problem. I can, so you can control it, I just can't get it right. <laughs> and it, it's hard for everybody to get right. There's, that's why there are all these fancy libraries built on top of thread building blocks. Hey, Steve? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, before you go into your code, right. can I interject for a minute? Sure. So uh, I just wanted to reiterate, sometimes I do, this is probably annoying to the people who are talking, but for no. the people who are listening to what Stephen just said, uh, to reiterate, basically you could have a function that had steps A, B, C, D, E, F, G, major steps, things that were done. And you would execute it, and they would all get done, and the, the function would run all the way through before it stopped. But with coroutines, what you're saying 
is you can take step A and do just that, but without leaving the function, you can say, function, just stop working for a while. I'll be back. Right? I'll be back whenever you tell me to start again. And then it goes on to step B. And then you can say, okay, stop working for a while. Then do step C. So it gives you this nice way to split up the work without having to do a lot of complicated coding. Yes. Would you would you would you agree? Am I sort of saying what you said? Right. Or or avoiding certain contortions. Right. Which I'll go into a little bit. Put it up into like seven different small functions and write some really complicated code. But with coroutines, you can literally say, just wait ten seconds and come back. You can set up a coroutine construct, which you've done in your example. Right, right. I'll be doing exactly this. that. Yep. Okay. So, so this is, so this is precision. Saw, I'm going to pick on Charles, but I saw Charles going, huh? Kind of like what? There for a minute, and so I just want to make sure that Charles got this. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, yeah. Exactly. And I, I, had I not seen this tutorial on YouTube, um, you know that. that the concept may seem, still seem a little squishy, but once you see it in action, you're kind of like, oh, well, that makes sense. So I think uh, Stephen's uh, created some demos for us to kind of illustrate that point. Yes, excellent. Excellent demos, actually. Some right. of his code I've already stolen. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go into them now. Okay. And so, and so while he's setting that up, I will say that uh, I'll post a link to the, the YouTube video that I was looking at, and it actually has a, a code editor on there that lets you, a text editor that lets you do, play with, um, and kind of like uh, experiment with different snippets of code. And it's, uh, they have Windows and Linux and, you know, a Mac OS version as well. So I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Are we seeing this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you can. This is how you create a coroutine. You just wrap it in coroutine create, put another function inside of it, and have it do whatever you would have it do normally. And you can then check the status of it. So this one, if I. So it's a using anonymous functions and. Oh right, I I I, I use those everywhere. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just for the for the people listening at home uh, who may not be able to see the code, I'll I'll narrate as we go along. But and then um, you know, I don't know that. I mean, how many people are actually getting into callback functions or anonymous functions and stuff like that? So it, that's a kind of a new concept to some people as well. So what are you you bringing up the Corona simulator here? Yeah. Awesome. Now, on your, um, we kind of talked about this before the show, but if you need to show, um, if you need, if you can, I don't know if what you have on your desktop, but if you if you can show your whole desktop, then you can flip back and forth between the apps pretty easily. Hey, yeah, I, I should probably do that. Let's see where is. Yeah, you can, Google Plus, uh, Google Plus, uh, you know, allows you to share any one of your screens, but sometimes it can be tedious to go back and forth. It also uh, loses its mind sometimes when you flip back and forth between. Oh yeah, apps. yeah, it, yeah. It only uh, sometimes it will only do that so many times okay. for it. So that, that just is the entire screen on then, right? All uh, right, now we got nothing, but it might be taking a moment. Yeah, just there we are. There you go. So now we're back to your. There we go. Now it looks like we have everything on one one screen. What's this Unity icon on the bottom of your screen? Trader. <laughs> <laughs> It's work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Yeah, trying to get a, you're trying to get everything on there all at one time. You maybe just have to all tab back and forth. Yeah, I think so. I'm what am I running into here? Oh, the joys of putting everything on screen all at once. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... So this... Doing it the first way, it, without anything happening, the status begins as suspended. So they don't act until you make them act. 
And try if we resume it, it'll do stuff that's inside here. And after that, it's dead because it ran to the end of the function. So they look like regular functions if there's nothing interesting going on. And so, so, so essentially, you're you're defining a coroutine, assigning it to an anonymous function, which does something, and then when you go in to actually utilize the coroutine, you're you're saying coroutine dot resume, and then you're yeah. calling that that coroutine that's been right because it defined. starts in a suspended state, so okay. you have to resume it to kick it off. You do that afterwards, it it says it's dead because it's run to the end, and if you try to resume it again, as I have down here, you will get. I'm going to resume again. It's still dead. <laughs> so it didn't come back to life. Hey, Steven? Yes. Can, I, can you roll up to line 27 for me? Sure. So uh, just uh, Charles has said this twice, and I just want to point this out to people listening. So line 27, it says at the very end, it says function, and then open, close, parenthesis, print inside a co coroutine. Yeah. That is, in <laughs> fact, an anonymous function because it has no name. Right. But it doesn't need to be the function that you're creating a coroutine from does not need to be anonymous. It can be a no, regular named function. That line there, co equals coroutine dot create, what it's doing is wrapping the function, which in this case is anonymous, inside some special code that allows it to be resumed and paused or to yield, which you're going to show us in a minute. Uh, but he could have created a very much larger named function somewhere else and said, I'm going to wrap this up as a coroutine. So yep. you, can have, you can have a function that nine times out of ten you call normally, but in occasion you might need to use it, you might need to call it as a coroutine. You could do that. It, there's nothing special about the function itself. Yeah, and, and one of the samples does show that where it's in two different forms. So okay, sorry, I keep interrupting, so I'll... I'm gonna mute myself. Here. And you see, you see also here that the type is thread, so it is actually a first-class Lua type. And when you were getting the uh, the part where it was saying it was dead, what what was that? Oh, that's status co coroutine dot status. Okay. Right. Suspended, dead, and there's a couple of others. I'll go on to this next okay. group of. Okay, so this I'm just starting with a fresh coroutine, and <laughs> we're back inside the coroutine, but it's it's dead afterward. And here I'm showing that you you get return values like you would from a normal function, but they have this truth thing at the beginning of them. And I'll cover what that is in a second. And also that they will take arguments. So if you pass in one, two, you get them inside the coroutine as one, two, and then C, we assign nothing, so it's nil. So there is a way. I won't be showing anything using that in this, but you can create some pretty fancy things by passing arguments back and forth between two coroutines. And there's, a, there's an excellent example in programming in Lua, the book by Roberto. Here, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Me? Or, okay. Yeah. So he, here, I'm I'm triggering an error inside the coroutine. I'm assigning to some value that has nothing. That it's never been assigned, and we get this result back. This error. Uh, it runs off the edge of the simulator, but we have false. So that says something went wrong, and then the the file, the the line in the file where it happened, and and we're dead again. So if you if you use resume, and an error happens, it'll it'll give you false and tell you, oh this happened. Inside of a coroutine, status is running, 
And there's also a function called running, which when you're inside the coroutine, you can ask it and get the thread reference back. And you'll see that it's the same thing as, as co. So these are the same. Finally, on this basic stuff, if you run another coroutine from inside a coroutine, the other coroutine is still running, but it's not the active one. So it's called normal. Now this is using a yield. So we resume as normal here. And we get inside the coroutine. But then we don't say I'm back. We get to this, this next line. So status after a yield. And it's suspended. Then we try to resume. Let's, let's try to resume. And we end up doing the rest. And after that, the coroutine is dead. And again, you can pass arguments through yield, and they'll come out. They will be returned to resume. So that's why I was saying you can pass them back and forth. You see I did not know that. That's, uh, that's good. Yeah, so you see 521B, and then resume. The rest of the print will show 521, the table B. These, these are handy, but not so much in the things I'm, that I made in the demo. But they are, they're handy for passing input back and forth or for doing iterators. Extremely handy. And this, this just shows all of it put together. So returns, yields, arguments to resume, and initial arguments. And you probably wouldn't use all of these together, but they're all, they're all there. So it's showing doing a loop, yielding each time in the loop, passing an argument through yield, getting it back in the resume, and you get this. So every time through, it adds some more. And fin finally, we come to this coroutine wrap. It's, it can get a little cumbersome sometimes to be using the create and resume machinery. So there's actually something called coroutine wrap that'll give you back a function that you can just call instead of going through a resume. Can I say, I love this function. <laughs> You've got a function. It's like a, a, like a thing. What is it, the enigma quote? you got a function inside of a coroutine inside of a function. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, I love it, too. It's, it's very handy. <laughs> so here, passing A in, getting, getting it in the arguments. So it, it's what this is showing is that it's basically like resume, except it doesn't give you the true or false. So here I will, after, I, after I'm done yielding, if I call it one more time, it's dead. Boom. Because it, wrap doesn't protect you from errors that occur in the coroutine. So, which, which might actually make it more useful in a corona program. You would want to fail if you have an error. It's worth noting for people who are going to look at this code that basically, in we're using the word basic, basic one, two, and three here, you've stepped through more and more complicated usages or setups of the standard uh, coroutine functions. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, make it easy for people to sort of walk through it and learn a little bit at a time. I hope so. <laughs> so, so just to kind of, to, to um, Reiterate what we talked about just so far. Uh, you, you basically you have 
you start out with your code example where you've got just here's how you use a coroutine. And then as Ed just said, you get more and more um, advanced with the examples as you go along. And in, in each one of those examples, you, you we were looking at um, the fact that we could we ha could have return statuses, uh, that, that we could show the type of the thread, uh, that we could we could yield and resume a, th um, a coroutine. I said thread a moment ago, but a coroutine. Um, also, that we could have multiple arguments, and yep. then we we could pass in multiple arguments. We could return um, multiple return uh, values. Return values. Yeah, return values. Uh, also, I saw that there were uh, varying argument types, so we could pass in a table, we could pass in a string, we could pass in a you know that sort Anything of thing. Anything you want. Anything you want. Yeah. And and I assume that you can return those as well. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then we looked at going uh, using a coroutine instead of a coroutine. Right. Uh, then there was uh, I saw that one on there you had the three ellipses, which I guess uh, if I remember correctly is a variable arguments, variable amount of arguments. Yeah. Yeah. Which so you I just did that. Uh, right. I just did that because I didn't want to walk through them. So. Yeah. Which well, no, that makes sense though. That's that's uh, keeping it flexible. Print, print will dump them all out. So. And then the coroutine wrap. I'm not sure that I understood the function inside of a coroutine inside of a function, but but I'm sure we'll get to the the why, why you what, would want that at some point. What coroutine wrap does is it gives you back a function instead of a thread, so you don't need to call coroutine.resume. You just call the function. Mm -hmm. It it it's a convenience wrapper for you. And, and why would you the resume code again? Hmm? The code? Show the resume code again, and then show the calling of a wrap function. Sure. If you can, if you've got that yeah. up. Yeah, I'm sure. If we, I'm sure you have some other examples that would clarify. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah I guess unfortunately I... for Stephen, this is one of those topics where you probably like take one or two days of lecture <laughs> to talk about it. Right. I don't so know. He, what, uh, here's what here's time. coroutine create and coroutine wrapped. So so far they're about the same, but wrapped you would just call the function and pass any arguments. And coroutine resume, you need to pass in the thread. So you need to keep the thread around, which on the one hand lets you more conveniently ask about its status. But on the other hand, it's you need to keep that around, and it doesn't have the same error behavior. Yeah, it's two, two major differences. Coroutine create returns a coroutine handle which you then have to hold on to and use over and over to do anything with that coroutine. Yep. Coroutine wrap returns a function, which then you can use just like any other function, and forget about all the coroutine stuff as far as calling it is concerned. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, t I tell you what, Ed, you, you're, you hit a, I think you hit the, the nail on the head that, that this, is a, this is a topic that definitely could take a couple of days worth of lecture. Yeah, I don't want uh, Stephen to feel bad because this is really hard to uh, cover and get everybody to grok in a short period of time. But his examples, and I'm not saying to stop, what I'm saying is his examples, people listening need to just go through step one and look at basic one and like tear it apart. Go read some docs on coroutines and it'll all become clear. Okay. Yeah. If we do need to set me aside, then just I, give me the word. <laughs> oh, I think, I think Please we... don't stop because you're getting to one of my favorite ones, which is okay. the weight. But go on. Well, let, well, let's 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 jump to the weight, and then uh, let's talk briefly about why you why coroutines, you know, would be important. And then I want to leave enough time for Renee and two D shadows. Sure. So go back. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the link to the repository afterwards, so people can go and look at the examples themselves. All right, here I'm, here I'm showing waiting in a timer. So instead of setting up a timer and having to, a, a timer, you can't create it just in line inside of the source body, right? You need, it, it's a separate function, and then you watch and wait for that, and then you would do the times up, et cetera, afterward. But here you can just make straight line code. And showing this three seconds, and then time's up. 
Can you, um, I, I, I keep stopping right. you. Two things. Sorry, remember, sorry, sorry. remember the discussion we had at the beginning about the recipes and yeah. doing step A and waiting and doing step B. Could you do me a favor, please? Okay. And copy line 35, uh, 33 and 35, and oh, just right. uh, paste them a couple times after each other. Sure. Because then people, I think, watching this will get that a little more. And then put like uh, times up one, times right, up two, times right. up three, so people can, yeah, awesome. Okay, sure. And now if we run that, it'll become clear what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, again, I'm using uh, coroutine wrap here inside of a timer. So that's pretty convenient. So it's uh, just to make sure I understand. Uh, it, so it's calling the uh, the wait, mm -hmm. uh, and then the wait. coroutine is stopping, or is it is it is yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. Wait is a little function I wrote. It just says when it wants to mm -hmm. complete. So it's a certain number of milliseconds from now, and then it spins in a loop, and it yields each time. So it yields the coroutine. And in in here, you you pass in a coroutine function as the timer, you give it zero so it keeps going. And every time the timer kicks off, it resumes the timer. So it will be resuming in here for three seconds, in here for three seconds, in here for three seconds, and then after it's done, continue on. You got that, Charles? I think so, yeah. Okay. Not, yeah. Uh, for some reason, I was just... Uh, I missed it's, the first part about... It's a, it's a super tight piece of code that you have to look at each piece. And then you look at it. So it runs every 20 milliseconds, and the running of it is the same as a resume. So if it was yielded, it gets woken up again. Yep. So so in, in, in one sentence or less... <laughs> <laughs> Co coroutines are, I mean, why would I, why, I see that they're powerful, I see that they give me the ability to do some pretty nifty things. Um, why would I want to use them? I mean, what, what, what's my killer app kind of use case? Code like this, where you don't have to, where you're basically just switching from one state to another, going, you're doing something, then you're doing another thing, where it's really just a series of events in a row. This makes it straight line code, whereas you would you would otherwise maybe launch a new timer at the end of this yeah. part, It'd and then launch another timer, and launch another timer, and <laughs> it, I can't even imagine how messy the code would be to do that same six lines of code, but achieve the same result it would be dozens of lines of code to get it right. And save. okay, okay, so so we're we're getting a an efficiency of of our code and our development process and all that kind of stuff. Right. And this this is time. There's also, you know, waiting on a condition to return true or waiting for a flag to get set in the object. I've got that here too. But you, you can just build some constructs and then use them to wait on. <laughs> okay. Are we still on that first one sentence? Yeah. <laughs> but, it's a you know. long sentence. <laughs> There's, there's no punctuation, but yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I know that there's somebody out there who is who is who's seeing this, who's just like they have fallen all over themselves, and they're they're just jumping with joy. Uh, I I know I don't have a particular thing in mind, so it doesn't. While I think it's really really cool, I I, I Ed has a greater appreciation of it than I do. I guess that I, I should say. So what I would I recommend everyone to do is we'll put a link in the show notes to all of these examples and along with other things that we've talked about. Go check that out. And then if you have any questions, I know uh, Stephen is star crunch in the forums, right. so you can uh, ask him those questions there. And I'm sure he would be happy to to illustrate more on how you can you know get the most muscle out of this code because it looks really cool. Um, and and uh, but we're we're going to be out of time for the moment because I want to get to uh, 2D shadows before we we jump out of here for today. So so Stephen, thank you for putting that together. That's that's those are cool. I mean that's uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, when I saw the YouTube video uh, earlier today, I was kind of like, oh, that looks that looks interesting, but I still haven't wrapped my mind around it uh, yet fully. But I I think it's going to be awesome once I do. So 
let's talk about something else that's awesome. Uh, 2D shadows. I mean, this is a this is a, a cool effect. And uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it, I mean, I don't know if Renee, are you have a, a demo that you're going to show us? Uh, yes, of course. I plan to show an example uh, after some screens. Yeah, give us a give us the background. You know, take us through what you know how you came up with this and what you're using it for and all that kind of stuff. Yes. <laughs> how I came up, of course, uh, after um, seeing Corona Geek Show number one hundred and nineteen, <laughs> where Ed Marina <laughs> showed us some vector stuff. Uh, uh, I thought about yes, uh, vector stuff is cool, and I have to build some <laughs> some. Uh, Shadow uh, system. The technique, the technique is rather old, and I was wondering nobody had um, made something like this with Corona. Um, I remember, I don't know, six years ago, I already wrote something like this in, 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 a, in a different language. Um, I prepared some slides um, how to how how I basic basically how the um, shadow polygons are, are created, and um, yeah, I think I just start. Okay. Uh, the slides. Uh, ah, screen sharing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> while while Renee's setting that up, I, I'll just say that yeah, there is a YouTube video out there that shows all of this stuff in action, and uh, we'll put a link to that as in the show notes as well as a, as well as a link to the slides. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, we can see it. You can see the slides now, yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, um, how do I move the slide? Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, the source code is it's all available uh, available at uh, Bitbucket. Bitly slash 2D shadows. It's all free. You can use it as you want. And um, let's start. Um, so to the right, you can see a screenshot of a basic setup. Um, you need uh, a light source. At the L, this is center of the light source, and you note a shadow caster. Uh, in this case, this crate with this center at point C, and there you can see uh, two lines of code how to how to set up a shadow caster object. Um, I created uh, in this line. I created a table with the vertices that describes the shape. Uh, of the shadow caster object, it's uh, like the polygon function of Corona. And uh, in the second line, you see the add shadow caster method. And the first parameter is the shape you can assign, and the texture file of the crate and the dimensions of the image. And basically, it's all to to, to set up a shadow caster object. Um, First step when uh, creating uh, the, the shadow polygon is to check which of the vertices is um, involved in throwing the shadow. Um, this is, uh, yeah, here we, I, I did use some vector stuff like dot products and checking uh, which um, edges between each uh, vertex between each vertices is uh, looking towards the light source or looking away from the light source and to sort out uh, which vertex is involved. And after that, we just create <laughs> um, some vectors from the light source to each vertex. And then we just project these uh, vertices. Uh, in other words, we just make a longer version of it. And so we're getting some new points. And basically, that's it. Um, these are all the points we need to get the shadow polygon. Um, yeah, that's the basic principle of, of shadow casting. So, so is this? Um, I mean, do you have to have a, a, an understanding of uh, high school geometry to do this, or I mean, what were you? What's this? What's the, the level here? Inter uh, is this intermediate stuff or? Uh, I think it's it's um, advanced. Good intermediate stuff. <laughs> good, good inter uh, solid intermediate. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 
of uh, vector math is in high school. I don't know the school system in the US. Um, it's, um, no, I think well, I, it's one of the last classes I had in my school time. And, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think I took vector math. I'm pretty certain of that. Yeah. And I know uh, it was boring and it was, wasn't fun. Because I did not know you can write a shadow <laughs> system. <with it. laughs> yeah, it would be much be cooler in school if you would uh, um, um, developing games using this stuff to teach vector math. It would be so cool. But <laughs> hey, I okay. think I think if everybody came dressed as Star Wars characters, I think school would just be much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Something I can show us in the last couple of days. I had time to, did an up, to, to do an update to the shadow system. And I've come up with some nice new features. And I want to show the most important. Um, now you can set up circle shapes. Um, because a uh, perfect circle shape, it's tedious to, 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 to describe a perfect circle out of um, vertices because it would be rather edgy or you need uh, very very many uh, vertices to create a nice circle shape so I overloaded the edge shadow caster method uh, and instead of assigning a table with a shape vertices you can just uh, uh, enter an integer and this is the radius of the circle shape and uh, another nice feature is uh, multiple shapes. <laughs> um, I added an add shape method to add uh, additional shapes to run to one shadow casting object. So this is just one shadow casting optic object. And this is the first shape, and I added a small second shape. And now you're asking, <laughs> what is this useful for? <laughs> and it is. It is for for um, <laughs> if, if you if you want to create complex shapes um, and even uh, concave uh, shapes, you just break down the complex shape in several convex shapes, and then you can create nice complex objects throwing shadows. As you can see in the next image, um, this beaker. It's a beaker. I don't know. This uh, Corona geek drink. Is, uh, has been broken down into one, two, three, eight, and eight into eight convex shapes, and uh, even cooler, you can just, uh, for example, use Code and Web's physics editor to auto magically create um, an, uh, the, the shape of this complex. You can just load the image. Uh, you can press the the wand, magic wand, and it automatically create a shape. For your object, and these shapes can be used in the shadow system as well, which is very nice. And it's uh, also working uh, with the with Corona physics system. Wow! Yes. And I, I will show uh, a short example in a second. Yeah, this is the vector stuff uh, um, that's happening with this complex Corona geek energy drink. <laughs> <laughs> So um, um, I will show you now <laughs> an uh, example before I come to the sun. Um, okay, here's. Do you see my screen yet? Yes. Um, okay, this is the uh, uh, setup with some simple objects, and oh, as you can nice. see. Uh, physics working and the light source it's all in real time and uh, yeah it's working nice and I have also a little example of no maybe first I show you how to set up this, uh, such a scene uh, first things you have to do uh, this is this one to require the shadow system this is uh, the only mandatory require this one is only the, uh, for uh, for my stuff. Uh, and next thing is to initialize the shadow system. These numbers are for the for the ambient light. This is the background light. The, the background gets a, a bit uh, darkened so that the shadows are visualized better. 
and after you have initialized the shadow system, you can just add a shadow caster with this line of code. And you need a light source, which you can do with the add light function. With the color of the light here, and the, this is the color, the radius of the light, and the intensity, and the nice lens flare effects here. <laughs> yeah, classic one. Okay. Uh, question for you? Yes, please. Two questions, actually. Um, okay. First question is, is the release that we're looking at right now out on the Git or the um, your repository? This one is a new one. I will upload it today. Okay. Uh, um, and, yeah. These are and my second now. question is, is between the time you released it the first time, you yes. made one update that I noticed. Yeah. Uh, and was that a, were you doing an optimization pass? Because it looks like it got, I, I looked at it yesterday. Yes. And I ran a sample with six shadow objects. Okay. Six, six uh, light sources and six casters. Okay. Which results in 36 shadows. Yes. And ran it on my Nexus 7 Gen 1 and got 30 frames a second. Okay. Which was way better than the performance on the first release. So I thought maybe you did something. Hmm. No? <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the update I made uh, was... No, I guess I should have looked just, at the diff. My bad. Uh, Sorry. No, no problem. But I, I, I only changed a uh, readme. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, maybe that's all it took. <laughs> well, the performance is excellent. I mean, it's really quite good for what you're doing, this complex number of calculations. Yes, uh, I um, have been afraid that the, that the performances would be much better, but it's doing nice. I am uh, surprised. Do you have any ideas uh, for soft shadows? Yes, I'm, I'm currently uh, experimenting with soft shadows, um, but I also uh, try to, to to let it be compatible to the starter edition of uh, Corona. Right. And with the starter edition, it's, um, well, I think I found a way, but uh, it's... Uh, Maybe it's blend it's, modes or, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, in fact, in the old version, it drawed uh, the, the polygons directly onto the screen with uh, display objects, but um, the new version is creating a an, an, an shadow buffer image. So all the... All the right. Shadow polygons are drawn in on a on a white background, mm -hmm. and uh, after it, this this new image is displayed onto screen with a uh, with blend mode uh, edge, I think, or screen. Uh, no, no, multiply. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Some of these. <laughs> you can figure and, it out. Um, yeah. And um, these these uh, shadow buffer technique. This uh, will make it oh, possible. Wow. To, um, oh. Nice. <laughs> I forgot to mention, I added my uh, code from last week, the rotating code, because I wanted uh, to see the performance cost if they were the shadows were constantly getting updated. Now, it doesn't look good with, you know, uh, the uh, Hangout because it's not getting a great frame yeah, rate, but it's yeah. totally solid on the device, which was a real surprise to me, considering yeah. the massive number of high level calculations you have to do to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Anyway, I, um, just wanted to, I just wanted to give you Benny's on the uh, coding. Yeah, thank you. Look at it carefully, <laughs> because in, your, in the forums, I promised you I'd look at it. I did look at it, and I found a few hot spots, but nothing where you could really make it faster without making it, like, less understandable. Yeah, okay. Well, if you have one, <laughs> tell me, yeah. You mentioned that. Uh, oh, yeah. The the lucky Luke problem. Yes. Are you having any luck? No, <laughs> no luck with lucky Luke. And, and well, for the for the rest of us, to explain the lucky Luke and what what, what was going on there. Yeah. The problem is when you when you um, move a shadow caster object with uh, with the transition to uh, command, uh, it seems that the tr transition updates getting updated 
I don't know, in a, in a, in a thread. I don't know. So uh, the, the, the shadow caster is um, faster than the shadow itself updates. So there's a little lag between the shadow and the shadow casting object. And yeah, the uh, transition is a continuous update yeah. that it continues to occur post enter frame. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to the code that calculates the shadow, the the x and y position of the vertices has changed mm -hmm. from the position that they're rendered at. So the object that is moving is in one position, but the vertices that represent it are in a different position when when the enter frame code starts to execute. Mm -hmm. Which you're using enter frame, uh, unless I'm remembering incorrectly, to start the sequence of calculations for shadows. Yeah, enter frame. Yeah, so uh, the way to solve that is to not allow transition to do the movement. Mm -hmm. So allow transition to update a temporary variable, like uh, x1, y1. Mm -hmm. to do the movement, and then every end of frame, the object that's being moved is responsible for grabbing the current value and yeah. using it and putting it in X and Y. Yeah. Yeah. And the key here is, is the end of frame for the mover has to be called before the shadow. So people listening, create the mover code, attach it and start it, then start the shadow code. Uh -huh. And then okay. you'll get rid of the lucky loop. Yeah, good idea. I forgot to say that, but this example here doesn't have the lucky loop problem. <laughs> and it's using transitions. Yeah, so it's it's just a, it's a question that has always been frustrating for me, is the transition keeps going subsequent to enter frame, and you've got that 10, 16 millisecond period where uh -huh. you could be doing work, and it could have been doing more updates. Yeah. So. Okay. So, um, I only have one last example with, uh, oh, moment, moment, please. Ed, are you going to be uh, uh, posting that code that you were just showing us? I'll, I'll send it to Renee, and he can put it alongside his example if he wants. Okay. I or I'll yes, wait, I, I can will. wait until Renee does his update and then, uh, you know, coordinate with him, because I, I want to keep it all with his repository. No, yeah, that makes sense. I just, you know, so I wonder if we could get access to it. Sure. Yes. I all your, all you guys, is hard work. Can we get access to everything? Can you just like do that for us? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I, I only wanted to show that this is working with uh, iso oh. isometric styles graphics. It's working, uh, working too. Very nice. Yeah. And, Very nice. Yes, definitely. And um, of course, I wanted to show the the Corona Geek energy drink with physics in real time shadows. <laughs> oh, with the real time shadows. <laughs> okay, that is really cool. That is yeah. awesome, is what it is. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, it is awesome. Oh my God, there was something else. <laughs> yeah, well, I, some some other thing I'm forgetting. I just, I, just, a I can't wait to find a real decent use for this in a game. A, I've got some fast, ideas, but nothing it's quite a, right it's, so far. It's a fast food game. It's a fast food game. You, you, throw, you throw the burgers and the fries and the drink out the window <laughs> at the customer, and then it, the physics engine's involved. And yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. Okay. So uh, have you done, uh, this is a side note since you were talking about the isomorphic, uh, isometric version uh, of things, H have you done much isometric uh, game development? No, not much. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I, I really would like and, and um, I um, like the tired, the free tired engine. Mm -hmm. and has the, I don't know, there are some uh, Corona wrappers for it, but... They are they are not developed anymore. I think okay. so. Um, I I have to to write on myself. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested in that topic, and I just you know we could if we could put together um, a discussion on that, I think people would definitely be interested in it. Um, oh, okay. So you got this. This is a you you referred to it earlier as a shadow system. 
So are you going to, are you planning to, you know, continue to develop on this or what, you, what, what are your plans there? Yes, um, my plans uh, are um, soft shadows, to support soft shadows. And I'm excited if, um, if the performance still is good with soft, with this soft shadow system because um, we had to draw a lot of, it's not me, uh, and to, to draw a lot of uh, uh, extra stuff. To, to use soft shadows and yeah, it's it's not cheap for this little extra cool coolness. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. You say cheap in terms of what? In terms of uh, performance or performance, in terms yeah, of performance. yeah, okay. and, and development, yeah, <laughs> and, and and development, yeah. Uh, one thing that I haven't had a chance to look at your code on uh, that occurred to me is uh, you might consider. If there's any parts in your code where you could cache the result of certain kinds of frequently made calculations mm -hmm. so at the mm -hmm. expense of a little bit of memory. For example, if you are doing any angle-based uh, calculations, you might be able to say, well, 1.5 degrees is the same as 2 degrees. Yeah, okay. You could calculate the if, – if you're always getting the same result – and again, this is based on just a thought. I haven't looked at your code, but mm -hmm. – I found for myself occasionally uh, where you're doing like these really heavy duty, a lot of square roots and cosine and sine, whatever, that if you can cache some of that stuff, it gets so much better. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed is all about the optimizations. He, <laughs> I'm all I, about, I, I just like to talk. Well, well no, you, I think I think there's everybody has that thing that they, they get excited about, you know, you, you, you kind of like see their, their their whole, their body language pops up and, and all that stuff like that and uh, Ed's Optimizations, Ed's thing. Yeah, he's right about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he up. Not really, but I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't want to leave Renee's topic, but I do want to make sure to say one more thing on coroutines. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. It's really hard to give what people will say, show me what coroutines do and give me a practical example. And you try your damnedest to give them what you consider to be a practical example. And they'll say, yeah, that's cool, but I'll never use that. So I'll give you an example that many people may use when they make a big game. Consider this. You're making a big game, and you have a lot of resources that you need to preload before your game starts. Let's say graphics resources, uh, database, things like that. You want to make download some files. And you're faced with this dilemma. Your game starts, it shows the launch screen, which is a static screen. Nobody likes to look at a static screen while they're waiting. What you'd really like is a spinner or a little bit of activity, something juicy to give them something to look at. Coroutines make it possible to write your loading code so that it does a little loading, goes to sleep. And when it goes to sleep, the code that does the animation could do a little animation on the screen. The next frame happens, you wake up the coroutine, do a little more loading. So what you're doing is you're splitting the time between frames with a little bit of loading, a little bit of animation, and it makes your product look a lot more professional while achieving the same goals. So and the, those wait functions actually have an optional update mm -hmm. that you can pass to them for that exactly. purpose. His code, which is like 100 lines of code or less, you could use that, strip it out of there, and use it for that exact purpose. Okay, so I'm thinking I'm thinking of things in, in big blocks, and what you're saying is that we're we're talking about slices of time. Time slice, that's the term, yeah. Yeah, coroutines are, are wonderful for uh, breaking up really large problems that would otherwise halt the progress of your game. Right. Okay. But another thing I sent to Ed was a JPEG decoder, <laughs> and those are slow <laughs> in pure Lua, but yeah. you can yeah. spread it out. If you did need to j debug a j uh, blah, blah, decode a JPEG in real time, you'd be hosed because you'd be like dead for half a second or more while you're while it was doing it. But you could put this in the background and have your your game still run or your app still run or give an indication that it was still alive. Yeah. So so what I heard earlier then there was that there when we were talking about uh, 2D shadows, we said there were some performance hits on um, on doing uh, soft shadows. So could you use coroutines and soft it's shadows scary, together? But you would lose the... Uh, you would have to... Uh, Renee was was probably, I saw Renee's eyes turn up. Renee was thinking, yes, you could do that, but <laughs> then your soft shadows wouldn't move. 
and not a lucky right. loop. Right, right. <laughs> because because it's per frame, maybe it depends. You learn, lose some of the fidelity or whatever the right word is for that. Yeah. Okay, so you're still working in slices of time, but you're st you, you have finite amount of time, and so it may not apply the to every situation. The problem is he is he must get the work done by the end of the frame. Yeah, it's graphical, so. <laughs> okay, so we, so any time that there's something that you can hide or or fudge things, then you're good. But something that's going to be obviously visual, you, mm -hmm. you probably can't get away with that. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes that makes a lot more sense. I was I was definitely thinking of things in, in stop and start, you know, big blocks, um, function type things. But that makes a lot more sense if you're if you're time slicing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Renee. I totally sidetracked. Were you going to do any closing comments on your? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, both of these topics were awesome. I know this is Charles's job, but I just want to say that these were both really awesome topics. I mean, coroutines I'm excited about because they help solve some really difficult problems, sticky problems that people don't even realize they may have or may just to go around. And then your shadow stuff, I've just been watching this for the last couple of weeks here or since you uh, released it. feels like about a couple of weeks, could be more. And uh, I'm just looking forward to, like, the next iteration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I, and I and I truly appreciate that you guys have put the time and effort into these topics and then shared it with everybody because that's yeah I, that becomes incredible. It's just like uh, you know just like we were looking at before with the um, um, the progress ring. You know, Jason Schroeder putting out his code that he would put together is just like that's, that's so generous with your time that I really I really do appreciate that and uh, and I know the community does as well. So thanks for coming on today and talking about. You know, demoing it and, and trying to help us wrap our mind around uh, how we could use it. So we'll have links in the show notes to everything that's uh, that we've discussed today. And um, you know, it sounds like there's some great things coming up around the horizon as well with uh, with the shadow system. And uh, and then you know, if you have any questions, like I said, for Stephen, you know, look for him at Star Crunch in the forums, and I'm sure he'll be happy to help you out. And uh, yeah, so. Um, Next time, I think we're going to talk about Ed. You, do you want to talk about um, uh, moving text and resizing text objects and moving text boxes next time? I know that sounds so boring. Now I know. I know it doesn't. We're going to do. We're going to go from two D shadows and <laughs> yeah. We're going to go from two D shadows and time slicing to resizing text. Uh, yeah, combine these two topics on the text, and they'll be good. Oh, that would be cool. But you know, I, I think they're important topics, and you put together the examples. I definitely want to go through them, and I know that it's something that people struggle with. You know, moving moving the text boxes, especially when they bring up keyboards and and, and things like that, and then getting things to look right. You know, it's just such a it's such a basic thing that while it's not vector math, it's still um, it's still an, is a, equally as important. So, uh, <laughs> well. Okay, <laughs> so so we'll talk about that next time, and uh, and we'll also do uh, we'll we'll talk about the January Geek Games uh, game that's out there, and and uh, you know get everybody kicked off on that for the new year. So uh, until then, have a great New Year's, guys, and uh, thanks for being here. We'll be back here next Monday, 12 p.m. Pacific, to talk all about mobile app development using Chrome SDK. Have a great New Year's. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Let me, see I, let me see if I can stop this thing. Which screen is it on now? I'm I'm so I'm totally confused. Sorry. <laughs>